This week on BTLM Presents. Some came, I understand, because they wanted to hear what Lazarus was going to tell them about death. Somebody with me? You've read it? But he said he said nothing about death because the dead know not anything. But Jesus worked that and performed that miracle so that he could start... You know what what Lazarus' message was? We think, boy, it has to be, let's see, the state of the dead, it's going to have to be done. His whole mission, Christ brought him back to simply to what? To tell the world that Jesus was the Son of God. Well, happy Sabbath. Thank you for your willingness, young men and ladies, to bring us that special music. You know, that's, you know, that really has a message in it, doesn't it? You think that's a children's song, but really for an adult, you know, let's let our light shine till what? Until Jesus comes. He didn't say there had to be a great big flame. He said, let that light shine. And that may be just a little light, but you know, it doesn't take much light in a dark place to make a difference. The darker it is, what? The brighter the light shows up. It hardly takes anything to be able to see your way. But the Lord said, let it shine brightly, and we need to be doing that before He comes. I hope you have your Bibles with you today, a subject we've been talking about for quite a few weeks. We want to talk a little bit more about, but I'd I'd like to read a passage of, of Scripture with you found in the book of John as we begin here this morning. The book of John, chapter 12, verse 34 and 35. John, chapter 12 in the New Testament, verses 34 and 35. Now, let me pose this question to you. As we read it, think along with me on it. Think as the Holy Spirit inspires you. How would you answer this question? How would you respond to this? Because I can guarantee you someday, some form or fashion, this question will be put to you. Now, notice here... The people, people usually talking and people in Jesus' time were usually trying to trick Jesus, were they not? And here it says, verse 34, The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. Interesting. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Now notice this, who is this Son of Man? What if someone posed that question to you? What if someone said something like, well, who is Jesus? 
Now I have that feeling that the ones who were asking this question knew who the Messiah was supposed to be or knew something about Jesus or something about prophecy. So I know that their minds, it wasn't something new as it might be an individual who's never heard about Jesus. They were trying to catch Jesus and they simply asked him a question, Who is the Son of Man? They were wanting him to make a commitment here. And it says, verse 35, that Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while it is the light with you, while there is the light with you, walk while ye have what? The light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Would that, is that a different answer than maybe what you might have come back with? See, they were asking the question, is who is this Jesus? Who is this Son of Man? And he was in, interested in them to say, you need to walk while it's yet light. Because the day's coming when it's going to be dark. Was he referring maybe to himself here? Well, the Son of Man was with them and walking with them and teaching them and encouraging them, helping to build them and to encourage them, strengthen their faith. They were yet fighting and turning away from that which is truth. He said, darkness is going to come upon you and then no one's going to know where they're going. I wonder if we're not somewhat in that time frame now. Somewhat in that time frame when you can look around and say, it looks like darkness is almost everywhere. With Joel, the Joel prophet mentions about gross darkness, you know, covers the earth. It seems that things are getting darker spiritually day by day, day in and day out. Jesus warned us to walk in the light. Now that's what we need to encourage one another with. We've heard it said here a few times in testimonies, and I'm thankful for testimonies where people are looking for truth. How about you? Somebody is searching and looking for truth. They find part of the truth, but they may hesitate to walk in the rest of the truth because they're not sure if that other part is truth or not. But what we must encourage them always with is they must walk in what they know and understand is truth first. And then if the other is truth, it will fit in its right place. And I consider this, if, if I've heard a lady say one time, I could never put these truths all together. I had a hard time with all of them until I finally found this one piece of puzzle that had the seventh day Sabbath on it. Are you with me? And when I put that piece of puzzle there in the middle, everything seemed to spring out from that center, which is Christ Jesus. I thought, how wonderfully put. Once we put that piece in there where he belongs, then these other things will begin to come to light. But to not walk in part of this light as we're growing, it means it's also careful it's going to be a rejection of it. So we need to encourage people, okay, you understand the Sabbath, for instance, it was mentioned... But we don't, under, we don't believe in Ellen White, someone may say. They need to be observing the Sabbath to the best of their ability and continue to study and to pray what will constitute the remnant church. And as they do that, and as they walk in the light that they have, do you believe today that God will shine greater light upon them, greater ability in their hearts and minds to accept that which they said they never would? You know, I had a brother who for years laughed at basically, be honest, at our health message. And that's never going to, never going to do that. That's crazy until, bless his heart, he had a heart attack, had some problems. And now today you find that, boy, they're going to check you out. They're not professing Adventists, but boy, you give them something, they're going to be reading. You offer them a cracker, they're going to read. You know, they want to know. They want to know if you're getting your exercise, if you're doing the right thing. Maybe disaster has to come upon us before we realize what we need to do. Let me address another question to you and how your answer. You can, there's a lot of different answers, I assume, it's, and I find to sometimes personal questions and how your life is with the Lord. Uh, there's different degrees of our walk with God. We pray that yours is onward and upward and mine day by day. But I often hear this, and I've wondered why this old saying has been around for, for so long. And uh, see if anybody feels that way right now. Usually it was the older people. It was people with two or three or four or five or six, eight, ten children running around the house. I heard my mother say it many times. She'd say, 
My nerves are shot. Well, you know, if your nerves are shot, that means you're finished, right? There's nothing left. But if I ask that question today, how many feel at times that your nerves are shot? Has anyone ever felt that way besides me at times? You know, and I've often wondered why we relate to, say, our, you know, my mind shot. No, my heart shot. But the real saying that keeps coming back is always what? Nerves. Why the... Why the nurse? What another, why not another portion of our, of our body? And as I was reading and studying, Ellen White made a, just a very interesting statement in Desire of Ages, page 568, of what we've been studying here. So don't feel bad if you say my nerves have been shot because there's times that our nerves get rustled and oh, every little thing just tears us all apart and you know, different things happen. But there's a reason why this saying is alive and well today and we've all experienced it at times. She says that demon possession cannot take place except through the nervous system. Isn't that interesting? Demon possession is not possible except it comes through the nervous system. It's very, very interesting. We wonder why, and everyone in here, hyper at times. We're nervous at times. And why different foods we eat, if they're wrong foods, what? It makes us what? Hyper. It makes, that's another nervous, isn't it? It's nerve. We have nervous, everybody say, oh, it's nervous energy. Boy, the, people who have a lot of nervous energy, if it's not squelched and put in the right frame, will lead sometime to disaster. Because they're always what? Into something. I thought, what a statement. And then we come back to the question we were talking about, who is the Son of Man? Is He the one that can heal these maladies? Is He the one that can heal the nervous system when it's afflicted? If this is the only way that the devil can come through to take possession of us, in, she says, greater or lesser degree. See, it doesn't matter how much... If it's he has, now you'll differ probably in some of these, but just think it out a little bit. Whether the enemy is in 50% control of you or, or in 20% control of someone else. Which is more deadly? Think of your answer for a moment. He's got 50% of this individual, if we could do this, and 20% of this individual. What's more deadly? Which is it? A, 50? B, 20? Or could it be C, they're both in trouble? If you really look at it and give you three choices, I have to say what? C, both in trouble. It just simply means the devil might use this one a little bit more, but he's using this one to what he wants this individual in their sphere of life, in their capacity. So he's using them how he wants to. But remember, he can't use anybody until you let him use you, or till I do. And again, it's things that we take into our, our body. We talked about for several, several weeks, and I thought how interesting that it is, and I want to look at several things, the degrees of, of demonic control, and how, how really real it is, and then focus with me again, the nervous system. Why is it we're easily upset? Why is it that our nerves are on edge? Why is it that we're nervous and edgy today, more than others? Because the devil is standing at the door doing what? Knocking to get in. Agitating, scratching, right? Da, da, da. Doing his best to try to get through that, hopefully that armor barrier that you have put around you. Right? Because to every morning, remember we're supposed to pray to put on what? The whole armor of God. And how many really put that whole armor of God on, friend? How many really does that? We discussed how is the character really developed. One morning we get up, our character is fully developed. Or is it day by day, gradual process? She relates that to demon possession. It's a gradual takeover by the enemy. A little bit at a time to suit his purposes for whatever it might be. So it's a gradual process 
of the character change. In the change to be like Jesus, it's a gradual day by day growing the same way. So the enemy once again has what? The counterfeit for the truth. He always has it there, but he's always changing it in the opposite direction that Christ wants you and me to be in. Good or bad. Ellen White makes an interesting statement. She says, you know, all that does not give themselves unreservedly, do you remember this? Unreservedly to the cause of Christ is in a greater or lesser degree in the control of the enemy. Is somebody with me? Unless we give ourselves how? Unreservedly to Christ, we are in a greater or lesser degree under the control of the enemy. You know, this just helps answer questions for me is why we see the world getting more complex, you know, more filthy, harder to live in. Things are just, you know, going on today. It's like just passing people's mind that should not be going on in the streets or in the newspapers or wherever it might be. Books that are written, programs that are made, is the enemy is taking control. The spirit is being withdrawn, being shut out. I want to turn in the desire of ages. This is, this, I'm telling you some good things we need to go over today, at least for me, was a, was a real blessing. As I began to study because of some of the problems that we have. Everyone remembers, I'm sure, Simon. We remember Simon had a feast. How many remember Simon when he had a feast and he invited Jesus? Now, Simon was a, you know, an interesting man. Uh, would we say he was somewhat of a leader? Yeah. A man of means, evidently. And here's a man of means and prominence saying, I'm having a party. Well, you know, you might feel kind of good to maybe give an invitation to that party because not everybody would. I think it is I heard on the radio that this is, was it Johnny Cash's when he passed away that they're having a special something for him for his funeral and so on. And they, you almost like you have to have a pass. You have to register somewhat for it and they choose the names that can come because there's limited space. With Simon, it may have been something that uh, special people would come to his house. He would be very cautious about some people that would come in there. He was accounted a disciple of Jesus Christ. And by the way, Simon, as a man here, uh, was he not uh, healed by Jesus? Yes. Of what? Leprosy. He was healed. And so therefore he was very interested in the work of Jesus. He counted himself as a disciple of Christ. He wanted to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but there were some reservations that he had. Inspiration brings it out. The reservations that he had, it was because, yes, he was healed. Yes, he was interested in the work of Christ. But she said his mind had not been transformed. I wonder if we have Christians like that today. They're interested in being a good Seventh-day Adventist. They're interested in attending services, doing some things, the right things, but yet maybe the heart, the mind has not been transformed. She even goes on to say some of his principles, that means his daily choices, the things that he did, the way he lived, were not changed. And so there were some problems there because they all have to be changed. Remember being healed of leprosy. I don't know how you would feel about it, dear friends, but I think I would be absolutely overjoyed. It was a loathsome disease that was very painful, evidently. It alienated you from other people. It separated you from family and friends. It was a horrible nightmare. And we relate it maybe somewhat to, to cancer. But I think leprosy in times of Christ was more evident, seemed like, in a lot of the outer... Seems a lot more in now, at least to me. I'm limited on my knowledge of it. More in the cancer and so on and so forth. The leprosy was something that attacked the limbs. Isn't that right? The face and so on and so forth. Uh, contagious. And so this man was healed of Jesus and so he was very interested in Jesus. He was drawn to Jesus. Here was Jesus going to, about six days before the Passover, was going to, to Bethany. Because he, and he was going to go to this feast at uh, Simon's house. And every time he went for the Passover, he always stayed at Lazarus' house. Remember, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. What a time that would be. See, people heard that here is Simon, here's a man they knew was doomed for death, had a disease that was incurable. He was cured. Here's a man that laid, what was he, three or four days, dead. They knew he was dead, and now he's back up telling all about Jesus. 
And so out of curiosity, people wanted to come and to be involved to say, I want to see this dead man walking. Somebody not with me. I want to see this man that was sick, that ready to die with leprosy, and now he's not. So many flocked there to see what was going on. Well, you know what happened as they begin to go, on, go to this, uh, this supper. It said on one side of Jesus sat down and on one side there was Simon and on the other side was Lazarus. Now that would be an interesting, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be a real interesting? Of all the people in that place, wouldn't most eyes be upon this group, would it not? You know and I know of the world, no matter how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of people will be around, if one of the rock stars come out, people are all looking at that one little place. And so they were focusing upon Jesus. They were focusing there upon Simon. They were focusing upon Lazarus to see what was going on. And someone had to be served at this great big outing that they were having. And Martha was busy, you remember, waiting, doing the work. Then we have this Mary individual. Her name that she didn't seem to want to work and want to do the things that was there because she was sitting at the feet of Jesus in front of these men and she was listening to every word that was coming forth from their lips. She had a real happy heart. Number one was because her sins had been forgiven her. Isn't that beautiful? Here's a woman, by the way, that had, as we're relating in what we're talking about here, who Jesus had to pray for. Was it seven times seven demons come out of her? You talk about demon-possessed. Mary recalls, according to Desire of Ages, of hearing the cries of Jesus to the Father to rebuke these demons to get them out of her. So she had a lot to be thankful for that day. How would you feel to know that you were transformed and right these demons had fleed and you were forgiven your sins? Wouldn't you be interested in sitting at the feet of Jesus? Friend, it's the same thing today. Your name is not Mary and mine's not either, possibly. But we still need to be sitting at the feet of Jesus, being thankful just like she was. And the other thing I guess that was really she was still so excited about, my understanding is that Lazarus was her brother. Is somebody with me? So therefore, and inspiration says her beloved brother. She thought she loved her brother and her brother had passed away and Jesus had brought him back from the dead. Do you think this woman wanted to miss anything that was going on, what Jesus was saying? what he had done for her, what he had done for her brother. No, she didn't have time to wait tables. She didn't care about eating. She didn't care about the get-together. She was wanting to sit at the feet of Jesus, and some people just did not understand that. Inspiration says that her heart was filled with gratitude. She longed to show Jesus some kind of honor, just like you might. Someone does something good for you, you might want to just say thank you. You may want to send them a card. You may want to do something. Gratitude filled her heart. It overwhelmed her and she wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus and certainly that was taken wrong. But we find this nice group of people here but also in the group we find another man. His name is Judas. Judas naturally was the treasure I thought was very interesting. He said he always carried around the, the purse with him because he was always collecting funds, it said, for the poor to help people. Inspiration says at the same time he was always reaching into the treasure himself and taking out for his own purposes, his own good. And when there was a need, there was very little in the treasury of the Lord. Is somebody with me? He felt evidently that he was in control of the money situation. He was highly esteemed by others. They accounted him as what we would say a, a, an executive today in the finance world. He had a mind like some of them didn't have, so they, they said, wow, he's got our confidence, man. He says, because he always said we need to be taking up money instead and giving to the poor. And so when Mary wanted to bestow all of her, her, her gift, as it were, on Christ, what did he say? Could we not get, why did she have to buy this? We should have right, purchased something of money we should give to the poor. Why buy perfume to put on Jesus? It's a waste. Now notice what happened. Everybody in there evidently was happy. 
I want somebody to relate with me today. Everybody there was somewhat content. Everybody was somewhat happy. They were glad to be there. We're looking at the great anticipation of what Jesus was going to say. Some came, I understand, because they wanted to hear what Lazarus was going to tell them about death. Somebody with me? You've read it? But he said he said nothing about death because the dead know not anything. But Jesus worked that and performed that miracle so that he could start... Te- you, know what, you know what Lazarus' message was? We think, boy, it has to be, let's see, the state of the dead, it's going to have to be done. His whole mission, Christ brought him back to simply to what? To tell the world that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. That was his mission. That was his work. Brought back from the dead for this purpose. So everybody's somewhat content, somewhat happy, but all of a sudden you've got one demon in the midst. Said the evil spirit, the devil, came into Judas. Selfishness came into him to say that money she spent could have been in the old purse here. Because you know I may need a new pair of shoes. Somebody with me now? Something he may need that he might be able to take out of there. So he began, went to Simon, the host. Now who do you go to? You go to some of the high ups and you begin to talk about your displeasure. She shouldn't have spent that money on Jesus. Should have put it in the box here for the poor. That was the right thing to do. And Simon says, huh? What? Well, maybe she should have. Well, after all, Simon's thinking here. Surely Judas knows. He's the treasure. He knows. He, he's, he's gained our confidence here. He's always a man that's wanting to give to the poor. He's always talking about it. He's always wanting to help people. He's a, he's a leader in the church. Is somebody with me? He's one of the disciples. Surely he's telling me the right thing. So he got tight. And then the host began to tell some other people and everybody got tight with Mary and they were ready to throw her out. And then we find that some different things began to happen. We know the story of of Mary and how she anointed Jesus. Desire of Ages says the acts of love and reverence for Jesus are evidence of faith in Him as the Son of God. Have you ever thought about giving evidence that Jesus is the Son of God by acts of love and reverence? Do you realize by coming to the sanctuary quietly, with respect, not the things that we ordinarily get involved with during the week, but come in here quiet, by just showing reverence in the house of God, we are saying we believe in the Son of God. When we come up and bring our gifts of love, our tithes and our offerings and the children's offering and we're giving, it says we're signifying and showing that we believe in the Son of God. Friend, how simple it is today. Christ, right? God, using Jesus, Jesus raising Lazarus out of the grave to simply what? Say, He is the Son of God. Today you have that same message to give. And I do too. And we can do it by acts of love and reverence. They said they shouldn't have bought this oil and this anointing oil and all this right here. Ellen White brings it very clearly in that the ointment was simply just what? That was really symbol, that which was coming from the heart. And Jesus wants to, what comes from your heart and what comes from my heart today, friends, very important. I read something today, I, this week, I guess, that I, like you do at times, you know, we read things from Scripture and we read them and we read them and then there's times that it bites us. Somebody with me. There's times, sometimes we say, somebody last week, week before last said, I've always known this. Was it you, Brother Doug? This is something I know. I've always known this, but here it just like, mmm, it did something. It made sense. And you think about Calvary, the sacrifice that was given on Calvary's cross, and you think, boy, what a sacrifice it was. And yet we think, well, that sacrifice is wonderful, but you know, it's not going to save everybody in the world. But inspiration brings it so clearly home again that the sacrifice was so magnificent, so perfect, so powerful that it would have benefited every individual that's ever been on the face of this earth. And I like what she says here. Notice this. Talk about liberality. It says, there must be enough 
We're talking about that power of the blood, right? There must be enough and yet to spare. There's enough to do it and then there's plenty left over. You know, to think otherwise would be for us to think in terms that His blood on Calvary could only atone for a certain amount. Is somebody with me? It could only, you know, 20 billion people or whatever in the face of the earth over time or whatever. You know, just however many. It was only, only that powerful enough. But she says every person that God ever created has ever been born on the face of this earth and then there would be plenty to spare. That fits into His character, does it not? That there are no limitations on Him. You can't say He's got this much and no more. There is no end to it. I thought how wonderful that is and it reminds me so much there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Simon began to doubt Jesus. And he said, if she knew what kind of woman this was, how could he have healed me? How could he have raised someone from the dead? And still yet here, if he knew what kind of woman this was, he would not allow her to participate like this, not even be around her. And there was three reasons he gave I thought was very interesting. Three reasons of why Simon said, I begin to doubt Jesus. Number one is because Christ allowed the woman to approach him. You know, the relationship of man and woman that day was certainly a lot different than it is today. But Christ was still opening avenues and doors, was He not? For man to, you know, quit looking just to himself and that we're equal here in the sight of God. And so when the woman approached Him, automatic Simon said, Now remember, Simon made, he came up to these points because of what Judas had planted in his mind. Is somebody with me? He may not have ever went that direction if it hadn't been for that individual who planted the seed in Simon's mind to said, look at her. She should have never done this. She's up to no good. You know she... He said, what now? What? Oh, well, you may be right. You know, I can just hear it. I can see it related today. They always say it takes one bad apple. Isn't that right? And, and we realize then the enemy began to come into them and their mind began to think. Now he said, the woman approached him. And then number two, it says, it did not instantly spurn her as one whose sins were too great to be forgiven. How could Simon, supposedly a follower of Christ, how could you today, how could I, look at any individual on the face of this earth and say, your sins are too great for God to forgive? See, you'd think that doesn't happen. But do you remember me telling the story about a month or two ago about a pastor in the area? That someone came to him and said, we need to pray for this individual. And the pastor said, I'm not praying for him because he's a homosexual. His sins evidently are what? Are too great. That's wrong. We must be able to pray for these individuals. Jesus was going to make a point here we don't want to miss today. But Jesus was showing that no matter how great the sins are or your life, it doesn't matter. Come as you are. That's what his message is to us today. The third point is Simon was gathering information. I'm sure Judas was pushing things in, you know, just to really fill the mind up to say, oh, oh. Jesus treated this woman as though he didn't realize that she was a sinner. You talk about a wonderful example for me and you. Somebody with me today? It said the way Jesus spoke to her, the way he conducted himself, as though he had no idea of her past. That's so beautiful. As a Christian, it touched my heart. So I'm thinking, wow, I've read this, I understand this, but how I need to implement that more into my life. How about you? You know, it's like us as Adventists today, and I've mentioned it many times before. If someone comes up to you and you're talking to them and someone may have, you know, something in their hand or eating something they maybe you think they should not be eating, can you not look beyond that thing and talk to them as a person that you love and that you care about? 
That's exactly what Jesus did. He looked beyond all of those things and saw her as a human being, an individual. I've often said that about a few health people that I know. Some of them can't do it and others, no matter what you're doing, and while they advocate a wonderful lie, they can come no matter what you're doing. They, they come to you and talk to you. They'll never mention that you're doing the wrong thing. They'll never even act like they know you're doing the wrong thing. Is somebody with me? And I told you before, one of them, Thomas Jackson. I've seen him come up to people, talking to people, and I know their lifestyle. I, I know how they, they believe firmly and what they've taught to people. And some of the people have been in their classes, and they're doing exactly. I've watched him. But he looks right in their eyes, and here they're doing this stuff and this stuff, and he's looking right at them talking to them, give them a hug, and boy, wishing them the best, and boy, just going around. I think, how wonderful. See, what would work best? Oh, my, what are you, I can't believe you're doing these kind of things here. Jesus, in his heart, inspiration brings out that he knew how he had to approach Simon in order to get his attention. If he rebuked him openly, it would have hardened his heart. And so he had to reach him another way. It was interesting how he reached him in Luke chapter 7, verse 40. We won't do it in our last 10 or 15 minutes here. It was very, very interesting. Ask yourself this question. Why did Simon think the way that he did after professing to be a follower of Christ, experiencing a miracle in his life, knowing about Lazarus, knowing about the miracles of Christ, knowing the life of Jesus Christ? Inspiration brings this out. It's so interesting says, because Simon did not know that God's son must react as God would react. Isn't that interesting? Somebody with me? See, Simon was wanting almost, almost for Jesus to grab the woman by the hair of the head and throw her out. Almost. You follow me? They were wanting to get some people in there and throw her out because she was a known sinner. Aren't you glad that God doesn't operate that way? He would have thrown all of us out. There would not have been hope for any of us. But here's Simon thinking himself righteous individual, looking at someone else and saying, we need to throw her out. And Jesus says, I need to reach this man because I love him. I've got to reach this man somehow, some way. Now notice how Jesus brings this parable quickly. Luke 7 verse 40 and on to 43. Jesus said to Simon, look, Simon said, Simon, I have something to say to you. What do you think Simon would say? Well, go ahead, Lord. He may have been looking to say, this is a nice party here you have. However he might have said, nice get together. Food's wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. He said, I have somewhat to say to you, Simon. Well, go ahead. Jesus started with a parable. Notice, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. Are you with me? One owed how much? 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave how many of them? Both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Man, this was a question, Simon. Who's going to love him the most? One owed him 500, the other owed him 50. Simon answered and said, well, I suppose he whom he forgave most. And Jesus said back to him, and he said to him, thou hast rightly judged. Uh-oh. Simon started to say, uh-oh. Uh-oh, I'm looking at Mary over here thinking she's a lot worse sinner than any of us, but really we've all been forgiven. Isn't that right? He was thinking. Interesting statement here, and I'll let you, you can read and study about it when you want to here, how it works and the depth of which it works here, because Jesus had to get Simon's attention because of other things. It was just one line on here. She said, Simon led this woman into sin. That's very interesting. See, we have to pay if we lead someone into sin. We have to pay for that eventually. Somewhere along the line, we lead people. Jesus was very clear when he said, it's better to tie a millstone around your neck, isn't that right, and cast yourself in the river than to lead someone in the wrong direction. So he brought this parable to Simon. Now, think about this. What was, what was the design of this, this parable? 
What was Jesus really trying to teach? Because if you look it up, I think like five, was it pence? 500 pence is equal to, we'll round it off, like $56. And 50 pence is like $6. They're both a little less than that, but about six. So we'll say 56 and six. Okay, who, who have, I owe $56, Lorraine owes $6. Brother Richard is the one we owe it to. He comes and he says, Ray, I forgive you the six. Oh, thank you, Brother Richard. Comes to me and 50 says, Oh, Brother Richard, I could have never made that up. Who's to be the most grateful here? What did Simon say? I guess he that forgave the most. Jesus wasn't trying to get the point of about um, different degrees of obligations. The point I believe Jesus was trying to get across that each individual owed a debt, a debt of gratitude they could not repay. Is somebody with me? It wasn't okay. You're a 50% sinner. He's a 20% sinner. Jesus was simply saying every one of us owe a debt that we cannot repay. There is no difference. This individual has one sin in their life. It is a debt they cannot repay on their own. Is somebody with me? This person over here, this Mary, has 25,000 sins against her. What's the difference? What did it take to rectify, justify, and bring them back into portion? See, he wasn't trying to say this is a lot, person here is a lot worse than a person over here because they have more sins. That wasn't a lesson at all. What was it? It's something they couldn't pay back. Let's put it clear right here. Right? We talk about uh, Audrey owes somebody uh, $10. I owe somebody a million. I'm a millionaire. Don't anybody take this wrong. I'm not. Well, I better change that. <laughs> Audrey's a millionaire. But she owes $2 million. I have $10, you know. I owe somebody $10, but I have nothing. What kind of boat are we both in? It's a debt that both of us cannot repay, regardless of how large one may be or how small the other. It's still a debt that we cannot repay. And we need help. All of a sudden, it brings us into focus that we can't look at this person over here and say, oh, they're such a sinner. Oh, they have a lot of problems in their life. When Christ looked at me and you and He says, Every, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You have a debt you couldn't repay. There's no way you can repay. You profess to be perfect and righteous and so good, better than everybody else, and you won't even associate, you won't even talk to, you separate from. Jesus said that about Simon. Simon said, separate us from these sinners. Jesus got right in the middle of it. He was seeking to save that which was lost. Friend, I'm telling you, what a God we serve. Jesus came to show Simon. Now listen, Simon, the professed Christian, the professed leader, you know, the high up, the man with the money. And we have this woman over here that was filled with seven demons doing every possible dirty thing in the world over and over and over and over and over so no one wanted to associate with her. She was talked about in the community. She was rotten in the community. Nobody wanted to deal with her in the community. And Jesus was showing Simon that he was worse than she was. Isn't that interesting? How can a church goer be worse than a harlot, than a demon-possessed individual? Jesus says he was. What interesting. I thought, wow. Simon looked at her and said, see this woman? She's a sinner. Is somebody with me today? And I'm sure he didn't say, see this woman? She's a sinner. See this woman? She's a sinner. See, it's different. I go to Loray. I say, Loray, you know, so-and-so is a sinner. Yeah. I go to Loray. I say, look, so-and-so is a sinner, man. I'm, th I'm really putting something into it, right? I'm, I'm going to make her believe it. I'm going to make her take my side on this thing. The Bible says there, and that's, that's uh, what, 747 in the book of, uh, where were we in Luke a while ago? Luke 7, about 47, says, oh, she's, you know, sis, this woman, she's a what? She's a sinner. But Jesus said, I say unto her, what? 
sins which are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth what? Little. Oh. Let me say today, friends, what was the difference in these two? How could we say one is worse than the other? Friend, Mary, listen carefully. Mary was a sinner pardoned. He was a sinner unpardoned. Who was worse? Did you get it? She was a sinner pardoned. She had so much to be grateful and thankful for because she realized she was a sinner. She realized she needed a Savior. She realized her, worth, her life was worthless and she was hopeless and was something she couldn't change on her own and there's no way else, no way out for this woman. And she came to Jesus and Jesus cast out these, these devils. Simon turned around after he began to see all these things come to pass, how Jesus was handling the situation. He knew what was going on. It says his heart was touched with such kindness and love for Christ because Christ was treating him differently than he wanted Christ to treat Mary. He could have exposed Simon right there and really nail him to the wall, but he didn't do it. But Simon was wanting Christ to nail Mary. I love that, that line today. Dear friend, I love that line that we are sinners pardoned. What's better, to be pardoned or unpardoned? Oh, friend, that's an easy question to answer. You have that choice today. I have that choice today. We won't go on. Our time is already gone with it. But I thought, how, how wonderful our Lord and Savior is. That He will do whatever is necessary to get you and me on the right track. Inspiration says Christ knew that this woman was a great sinner, but listen carefully. He knew the circumstances that had shaped her life. Isn't it wonderful to know today that you serve a God who knows your circumstances of life? He knows how you were born. He knows what circumstances you've lived in. He knows the pressures. He knows the turmoil. He knows... The surroundings. He knows how you were brought up, what you were taught, what went through your mind, what you were exposed to. Maybe you didn't even want to be. He takes all of that into consideration and yet there's ample power enough to change it. Inspiration says Christ could have looked at her and just a couple of words just extinguished that little spark that was left in her. He could have extinguished it just like that and that would have been it. But he refused to do it. Friends, you realize we've, we've probably extinguished a few sparks in our time. There's been some sparks out there. Somebody just needed a little bit of encouragement, just, just, just a word of love, just a phone call, a card, whatever it might be. But, you know, we, we extinguished that. We took the fire extinguisher. We, we put it out. I'm so thankful today as he looked to me, I want him to see a spark left, don't you? A spark that he's going to rekindle, and plant, right? And, and pretty soon we're going to see a flame. We're going to see a flame. We're going to see a fire that will reach around the world. And you can be a part of that. And I can be a part of that. I'm thankful and grateful for that today. And friends, you may not hear it physically, the voice of your Lord and Savior as He stands in the most holy place crying in your behalf today. Do you believe it? Is that where He's at? He's in the most holy place. But see, Mary heard... Seven times she heard his rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and her mind. We talked about how does the demon come in quickly? The nervous system. Mind, nerves. Seven times she heard Jesus rebuke those devils. She heard his strong cries to the Father in her behalf. And she knew how offensive sin was to him. In human eyes it said her case appeared Hopeless. But Christ saw in her the capabilities for good. Friend, let me encourage you with that today. You may not see that there's any good in you. When you sit down, you begin to contemplate. You know, sometimes we sit down and we think, man, there is no good. There's nothing good in which I can do. Catch yourself quickly with that. And say, you know, that's exactly right. There's nothing good in me. If there be, it's Jesus, right, who lives in me. 
There's hope today. He sees the capabilities for good in you. And he sees them in me. And if it takes more than seven times of crying out to the Father to get rid of these demons and the problems in our life, he will do it for you. So if you don't hear that voice as she did, friend, know that he's doing it in your behalf and in mine today. Because you know what? He loves you just as much as he loved Mary. He loved you just as much as he loved Lazarus. And certainly if he can bring him from the dead, he's going to bring the righteous, right? From the dead and be able to live forever. Friend, you can make that choice today. So today, even though we felt at times that our minds are shot, our nervous system is shot, let's pray. When we get nervous, Lord, help me, right? Encourage me and strengthen me. You call upon the name of the Lord, what does He promise to do? Promise to hear and to answer. He says, before you call, what? I will answer. Friend, do that. Before, right, you know that God's going to answer your prayer. He's crying out in your defense today. He's standing before the Father, pleading your case and mine today. And friend, when he does, it is not hopeless. It's sure victory. And victory can be yours. How many want victory today? By the blood of the Lamb. It's big enough, isn't he? Let's pray, shall we? Let's kneel together. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for the blood that was shed in our behalf. Blood that's so powerful that it can cover every sin, every transgression, every problem in this world. Every individual. And Lord, we're just grateful and thankful that you were willing to come down here and to pay the price. Now today, as we contemplated your word and how wonderful and good, long-suffering, goodness, merciful, forgiving, we pray that we will, each one pray daily that these attributes will become our attributes. That not no longer our character, but your character. That we need to look to each one with a heart of love. Look beyond the faults. And to see the needs of the individual. Not to feel we're so much better that we can have nothing to do with a person, but reach, seek to save that which is lost. Certainly using good judgment to maintain our Christian integrity, but also Jesus left the 99 and went to seek and save that which was lost. That one. Father, may we always remember the parable that you gave us of the parable of the 500 and the 50. It's not a matter of how many. It's a debt that every individual owes and we cannot, no matter how good we might think we are, we cannot repay it. You're the only one. It's by your blood. May we accept that sacrifice today and may we thank you for your blood that cleanses us whiter than snow. Thank you for your love and for your mercy. Thank you for reminding us that you love us so much. In Jesus' name we pray.